We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning um, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this morning and um, uh, and uh, helping us to work through this um, uh, this very, very complex and challenging issue that we've uh, we've brought to the IGF this year. My name is Madeline Carr. I'm a professor of global politics and cybersecurity at University College London. And together with my colleagues, uh, Pablo Hineosa, Louise Marie Harrell and Duncan Hollis. Um, we've been putting together round tables on, um, at the IGF on, on issues that we feel um, are of relevance to internet governance, but perhaps haven't yet been picked up uh, in, in this forum. And, um, and this year we're, we're trying something new where we wanted to look at uh, governance of the supply chain um, in uh, the Internet of Things for cyber physical systems, particularly um, in this case, uh, connected autonomous vehicles, which have, uh, of course, a safety critical element. Um, we brought together a, an, an amazing lineup of people who really have um, a tremendous amount to contribute to this discussion. Um, but also people who um, represent sectors that haven't necessarily participated fully in the IGF in the past, um, which, which we feel is, is really essential to the, the conversation. So um, we have a, a quite a, a tight schedule and, and, and um, we want to leave time uh, this morning for input from uh, other participants as well. So we're going to work hard to, to stick to our plan and, and hopefully uh, capture a wide range of views. Um, I mean, we see governance of the supply chain for all sectors, but particularly for connected autonomous vehicles as a key challenge uh, that will require many views and perspectives to be taken into account. Um, from an industrial perspective, perspective, sector leaders really need an understanding of what vulnerabilities are emerging how those vulnerabilities congregate and what steps they, they must take to mitigate against them in a, in a responsible ethical manner. Um, ensure, ensuring supply chain security and critical infrastructures like transport will be essential to promoting sustainable cities and, and communities in which people can take full advantage of emerging technologies with the confidence that, that their safety and their rights will be respected and, and upheld. And, um, I, I guess essentially we, we chose connected autonomous vehicles as a very, very complex case, a com very complex supply chain and a supply chain that ends in a safety critical uh, function with, with you know, real implications for, for um, not only data breaches or, or, um, or other uh, more conventional um, vulnerabilities, but also you know, potentially loss of life. So something that we really need to take uh, very, very seriously. Um, and in a sense, we're asking it questions about whether the internet that we have is really ready uh, to connect these kind of systems. Um, and I guess the, the, the short answer is um, no. <laughs> um, so, so what needs to happen in, in terms of internet governance to prepare us for what's already happening, which is that we're connecting these systems and, and, and utilizing this infrastructure. At the same time, we, we recognize that internet governance has been a very flexible and adaptable um, uh, model. And perhaps there are lessons that we can take from how internet governance has, has adapted over the years uh, to, to accommodate different systems, processes, practices, and, and bring those lessons into the, the thinking about how to governance, how to govern the infrastructure that, upon which these, um, these safety critical systems will rely. So we have a, um, 
a, a, a lineup of speakers and we have we have sort of set times that we'd like to bring in the community as well to comment. And so there will be opportunities for that. And we really encourage you to do that. In, in an effort to kind of save time in our 90 minutes, we will keep our introduction short, but we have a PDF um, which put, will be posted in the chat with the full, um, uh, but it is in the chat, thank you, Lisa, with the full biographies of all the participants so that you can um, you can see who's who's speaking and where they come from. Um, in the first instance, I'd like to hand over to um, my colleague Louise Marie Harrell, who who will um, take us through a kind of industry perspective. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Madeline. Um, yes, I'm Louise Marie Urell. I am based in the Department of Media Communications over here at LSE, working uh, on cybersecurity and uh, incident response more specifically. And I have the immense pleasure of, um, of just kicking off our discussion here from the industry perspective. And I have three, um, well, one person unfortunately could not join us, but I'll definitely make my best to um, to reflect uh, his notes and points that we discussed previously. So together with me, we have uh, Jennifer Tisdale. Uh, Tisdale. Uh, she's, uh, she leads the cyber physical work at Grimm, uh, combining the world uh, of smart mobility and cybersecurity. Uh, we have Martin Emelet, uh, which is the European Regional Director for Auto ISAC, uh, which unfortunately, as I said, could not join us, but I will be sharing some of his thoughts and points. Um, and we also have uh, Mitra Mirhasani, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, which is uh, the co-director of Shield Automotive Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at the University of Windsor. Uh, so as you see, I mean, we do have some very brilliant minds here. And just to kind of kick us off, um, I just, I'd like to kind of reflect on, on some of the things that Madeline already started talking about. So, um, she mentioned, you know, that we're dealing with a very complex kind of environment in terms of what's connected to the internet. Uh, we're dealing with safety of critical issues. We're asking questions of whether the internet we have is already ready to connect these systems. And I, I think we can agree as, as she already said that, no, we're not ready, but there are very good people working to ensure that we do have standards, procedures, uh, regulations that we'll, as we'll talk later on uh, to make sure that we have good uh, risk management practices in place, that we do have spaces for dialogue within industry and outside industry as well. Uh, but I, I just wanted to kind of bring some tough questions here for us to kind of start thinking, right? Uh, so in thinking about this discussion within the context of the Internet Governance Forum, I think we really need to dive deep into who needs to be brought at the table, both within industry and outside, when we're talking about connected autonomous vehicles, um, you know, how to ensure that standards that are being developed or regulations or uh, sector-specific practices that they are actually not only a reflection of one specific silo, but that we're talking across different stakeholder groups, right? Um, what are the concrete changes that we're aiming at? What are the goals that we as, you know, an industry more specifically has been putting uh, to actually ensure that we go from talking the talk to walking the talk, right? Um, and I think just to start out with the points that Martin has already, um, sent out. So as I said, Martin uh, works uh, with uh, Automotive ISAC. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Auto ISAC is the Automotive Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, and those working in cybersecurity, you might have been acquainted some, somehow to other ISACs, uh, such as the Financial Security ISAC, uh, which works with SWIFT network and, and all of that to actually protect uh, the financial sector. But here we're talking about a very specific ISAC, which is dedicated to the automotive sector. And, um, and Martin notes that, you know, the main goal of Auto ISAC established in 2015, which was kind of surprising for me uh, that in 2015, it's kind of particularly recent, um, uh, is a global information sharing community that seeks to increase the resilience uh, by sharing potential vulnerabilities between members of the automotive industry, 
along with a whole supply chain um, before they manifest themselves. So really trying to ensure that you have uh, a, a previous information so that you can respond more proactively whenever something else uh, comes up. And also, I mean, different industry partners, they are kind of engaged in mapping different kinds of vulnerabilities, depending on which part they are focusing more or investing more in terms of security. Um, so he knows that, you know, comp companies really need to establish a vulnerability sharing plan over the whole life cycle. So it, it, it cannot be just a piecemeal approach when we're talking about that, because it just provides a myopic perspective of threats. So you can have a very clear perspective of how threats operate in one particular environment, but you do need to think about the supply chain as part of all of that, right? Um, and, and this is our attempt to like go beyond the, the cybersecurity discussions around solar winds and colonial pipeline. I mean, there are many critical systems such as the automotive sector that really require our attention uh, more deeply and carefully if we wanna think innovation in a secure way, right? Um, and, and he notes that uh, while the life cycle security uh, of information share is desirable, uh, the complexity of implementing cybersecurity management process processes for the autom automotive sector is really difficult. And one case that, that he brings is the ISO CAE 21433, and I'll share the link after, after I speak. It's a standard that was published in 2021, August, uh, and it specifies engineering require requirements for cybersecurity risk management. And another example that he also brings is a new regulation, which is the R155, which I will also share later on, uh, which was uh, approved uh, by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, which is very, very interesting. Um, so on the ISO, uh, as I said, it specifies kind of best practices in terms of cyber risk management for that particular sector. So that includes uh, product development, production operation, maintenance and decommissioning of electrical and electronic systems for road vehicles. Um, and this regulation from the United Nations, which has also kind of been kind of translated to different countries' regulations already. So, for example, uh, it, it established and requires a cybersecurity management system. And countries such as uh, Japan has already indicated uh, plans to apply these regulations. Uh, it should be applied up until July 2022, which is kind of an interesting time frame. Um, so the Republic of Korea, for example, uh, has also adopted a stepwise approach introducing the provisions of the regulation on cybersecurity and national guidelines until the half uh, of, of next year. And the European Union, as I said, also kind of passed a new regulation on cybersecurity that will make mandatory for all new vehicle types from July, 2022, and it will become mandatory for all vehicles produced from July, 2024. So as we see, I mean, we're here in the industry discussion, but we're already hinting towards uh, uh, Duncan that will uh, moderate the, the regulatory parts, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see these developments. Uh, so these are the points that, um, that Martin brought, but now I will leave it to uh, Jen to continue this uh, conversation. Jen, over to you. Hey, thank you. Yes, my name is Jennifer Tisdale. I'm with a company called Grimm. We are solely dedicated to the adversarial perspective for embedded systems or cyber physical systems security. Um, so all modalities of advanced transportation fall within our purview and the topic of automotive is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm greeting you today from Detroit, Michigan, where we like to consider ourselves the home of the auto industry. And to the point that the auto ISAC has only been around since 2015. That is also the length of time we've paid any real attention to the totality of automotive security. Um, so it is a very nascent industry. There are a lot of things changing at a very quick pace, as I'm certain that you all appreciate. Um, and I have three areas that I really wanted to uh, highlight for the audience today. Um, first and foremost, the topic of supply chain. Um, and specifically securing the supply chain in relation to connected and automated vehicles. And one day soon, autonomous vehicle systems as well. Um, there are areas that we need to consider that fall both within the vehicle, including technologies, infotainment systems, et cetera, all of the technologies that we are introducing within the system of systems of the vehicle. 
But in addition to that, the manufacturing environments where the non-technical pieces of the vehicle are being produced, um, the IT and OT environments that converge together for the production are also insecure. And that is an area that we are um, analyzing and researching today about what type of impact spoofing or skewing the quality of the goods in production can have on the operation of the vehicle. Um, and not to overcomplicate the topic of supply chain, but I will, I suppose, um, to take a more holistic view is the environment in which these connected vehicles are operating. So we are introducing increasingly um, via government and private sector, um, these connected environments in which the vehicles are operating in their day-to-day. -day. We're looking at intelligent transportation systems, smart city infrastructure. Um, so depending on how broadly you would like to define the term supply chain, um, the complete automotive ecosystem for connectivity is increasing year over year. Um, and hence, with that increase in connectivity comes an increase in cybersecurity vulnerability and the potential thereof. Um, so, so for the first point, you know, identifying and properly defining what the supply chain is for the purposes of this conversation, I think becomes a very large topic when we're talking about policy, because not only do the systems need to be interoperable, but the policy that impacts the supply chain must also be interoperable and holistic in approach. Um, with that, that leads us into um, the second point um, of smart policy. Um, and, and it's one of the challenges that we've seen here in the US, um, and we know that it is an international problem overall, is how to have cohesive and consistent policy for connected and automated vehicles that cross borders, um, in large part in relation to the connected infrastructure that needs to be implemented and integrated into our cities and roads for the vehicles to operate, um, policy for those systems, which are generally government oriented um, in terms of the integration of those technologies versus the private sector. Um, and then of course, working with the private sector for the vehicle production to make sure that the technologies are secure. Um, so there will be a need to, to be nimble um, in our policy making, much like there is a need for us to be nimble and flexible in the integration of the technology um, in relation to cybersecurity as the threat landscape is evolving um, and ever changing and the methodology to breach these systems are also evolving and changing. Um, so the only thing that I can think of, and I hope nobody is offended by this statement, the only thing that moves slower um, in terms of, of changing um, academia or changing um, how we manufacture goods, the practices, the R&D, the process implemented, the only thing slower is the policy making. And typically, at least in the States, by the time we get policy approved, something has changed in the technology that now needs to impact how we view the policy. And one of the examples I will give to you for that um, in the US is the Right to Repair Act. And the Right to Repair Act was originated to let consumers have the ability to repair their own vehicles, that they should have that ownership to level the playing field so they wouldn't be beholden to car dealerships or automotive OEMs um, for always uh, having their vehicles repaired. They could do it themselves. It increases the economy by enabling mom and pop shops to um, have you know, local mechanics that can repair vehicles. The troubling thing now is that there is a need to look at all of the electronic components that are integrated into the system. And so where does the consumer's right begin and end versus how the automotive industry is to secure the vehicle? Um, we don't have a lot of systems where you can go to your corner, corner store, if you will, buy a vehicle um, and then manipulate the electronics in it for whatever the reason might be, right? Maybe you want to turn off your navigation system or things of that nature. As a consumer, do you have the right to do that if it impacts the functionality of the vehicle and ultimately your safety or the mm -hmm. safety of others? Um, so that brings us to the final point. Um, which and is my 30 ability. seconds. Sorry, just, just okay. so we're really on. <laughs> Sorry. Right. 30 seconds left. We'll talk about liability. Um, and when we have this ecosystem where we have government, um, academia, industry, and consumers um, coming together into this one ecosystem of the car, 
who is responsible? If the consumer is able to adjust the technology within the vehicle, is the OEM responsible? And, and that's really the teaser today is where do the rights begin and end and how do we keep people safe? Damn. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I think that is a, a very good transition already uh, for uh, Mitra. Mitra, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, um, I'm the co-director of SHIELD Automotive Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Um, we are right across the river from Jennifer uh, in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And um, as a result of our close proximity to Detroit, there are many, um, you know, industries that are dependent on uh, providing parts um, and supplies for the automotive industry are housed in um, Windsor, Ontario. Um, the one that I so I decided to talk a little bit, um, take you guys to to the micro nanometer dimensions and provide a little bit of uh, thread that is coming and is basically um, put a little bit of lights and shine a little bit of light on it. Um, so we, Jennifer talked about the consumers who might be able to change uh, the setting of their cars. Um, my example is coming from um, manufacturing and integrity of the parts that you receive. So when you, for example, um, when we want to have or create a complex system, which is composed of many, many electronic parts, what we generally do is that we trust a manufacturer that is doing the cheap manufacturing and we go, we are kind of buy those parts and these are these parts are not anything specifically, you know, um, dangerous looking. They are the ICs, the integrated circuits that you have at the almost everywhere these days from your toaster oven these days, <laughs> smart ones, all the way to um, critical infrastructure in uh, power plants and so on, on um, different uh, very sensitive parts of the, you know, um, uh, applications. So when we buy these parts, we trust that the manufacturer has done or actually has created the schematics, the circuitry, the, you know, these designs exactly as it's promised or exactly as we ordered it. So we did a little bit of uh, test um, a couple of, oh, actually now it's about a year which pandemic days are kind of uh, blending into each other. We did a little bit of test. Uh, we bought 100, uh, 100 parts, 100 of these uh, electronic parts off the internet um, from reliable vendors, not from black markets, gray market, or anywhere else. And we brought them home to our labs and started looking at them, removing layer by layer uh, the, 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 the surfaces of the devices and just check them out. Wanted to make sure that what we bought is exactly what we want it, to, uh, want it to be. Well, right away, most of them, uh, kind of yelling the parts, uh, basically they were literally yelling that we are not the exact parts that you wanted to from very small modifications in how the numbers are or serial numbers are kind of created all the way to the nano dimensions where we saw some irregularities that are not supposed to be there. Um, the results were kind of uh, worrisome because only 22 uh, were um, true parts that we were supposed to buy. The rest were either counterfeits, um, either made by someone else and or um, they had extra components in them that were not supposed to be in those hardware. So what's the danger here? The danger here is that those extra parts that are there that are not supposed to be there, and we call them Trojan hardware, those are giving or taking away the control. They can take away the control from the consumer, from the manufacturer, from whoever is driving the car or operating those devices. Again, all the way from airplanes to uh, power plants to automotive, those parts 
can basically have a mind of their own, operate this the way they want. They can all of a sudden stop clocking the system, raising the memory, changing values, or uh, kind of leak information. Or they can also be causes of um, worms into the network and create a little bit more headache for everyone. Is it easy to find them? No, most of our approaches are destructive. We have to take the part, remove layer by layer of material, and kind of do a destructive test and find them out. Is there any solutions? Well, there are, but they're all expensive. It means that when we do design the circuitry, we have to either integrate the solutions right away into the IC, into the circuitry, which means that the hardware is going to be bulkier, more expensive. Mm -hmm. It needs more testing, hours and hours and different configurations in order to smoke these things out of their lo hidden locations because yes. they're not getting activated easily. Um, two, securing... Three seconds. <laughs> is wrapping up. Uh, two, cause it to basically changing the policies of supply chain. We have to ensure and we have to tighten our regulations around the where we buy, how the manufacturers are generating or manufacturing the parts. And that's the part that the policymakers are coming in and basically creating certified, trusted manufacturing line for us. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um... Thanks so much, uh, Jen and Mitra, for uh, raising very important points. I guess we're going here through kind of a very interesting flow, right? We started the discussion with kind of the big governance questions. What does it mean in terms of internet governance to think about, you know, the government governance of security and more specifically the security of, auto of the automotive sector, which is interconnected to, you know, the way in which devices have populated uh, both our everyday lives to kind of industrial systems. Systems, right. Um, so I guess, you know, we went from that discussion, we then kind of transitioned to what has, you know, what kinds of, let's say, broader standards or regulatory um, frameworks have been developed so far, even though that's going to be kind of delved deep in the other section. And then we kind of transitioned to Jen's point about the environment of complexity, how do we ensure that policy is connected to the industry solution? How do we make sure that policy is responsive, but at the same time kind of adaptable given that environment and thinking about consumers at the end of the day as well. And you, Mitra, very well kind of also brought that other dimension. What does it mean when we look deep into those components? How, what, do, what happens when we kind of sandbox the, all of this and try to see whether it is counterfeit? And that is where we get at least to kind of one of the very kind of nitty gritty dimensions of what security is. Um, I think sometimes we make it so abstract, right? But I think there are many layers that we're peeling over here from this discussion. And now I would really like to just open up for, um, for questions. Uh, we have uh, approximately seven minutes for us to do that, but maybe I'll just kick off with a very short question uh, for each of you, and then we'll kind of Please keep it coming. Use the chat function to all participants out there. Please feel free to just unmute, raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, but the question that I have for uh, Jen, um, really quick question, though challenging perhaps, um, is what can we do about this policy interoperability, right? You talked about the systems interoperability and you talked about the policy interoperability and you talked about this right to repair, right? So uh, could you talk a little bit more about what this, what could this be like this policy interoperability? How can industry, you know, engage more in that debate or, or what does it actually mean in practice from your experience? And I guess to Mitra's point, um, I would be really interested in kind of, um, and hearing about the problems of subcontracting, if you can expand a little bit more on that and what does that mean, like ensuring the hardware security. Um, so yeah, over to you while we wait also for other folks in the audience to speak up. I'll start. Um, one of the very first things that we can do is to not make decisions in a bubble. Um, we really need to have more public-private partnerships when it comes to these policy-making um, decisions. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because there are so many moving pieces 
in this technology and the integration of the technology and the associated policy making. Um, in the example of the Right to Repair Act, um, it certainly is, it takes the voice of government, the voice of the automotive industry and the supply base, as well as the voice of the cybersecurity researchers. So whether it comes from a company like mine or a university or what have you, having the ability to understand where the vulnerabilities live within the technology and how to make smart policy that can be nimble enough to change over time, to change at the pace of technology as well. Uh, and so having those formal discussions, much like we are today, I think this is very valuable and exciting um, it, it to bring all of the thought leaders together so that we can have a discussion about what next steps might look like. And so that would be the very first and foremost thing that we would need to continue to do. The, to answer your question, um, uh, the, uh, this is the time that policymakers have to start moving fast um, because the parts are already here. And when I talk about this Trojan hardware, most people say, well, no one knew about it before you brought it up. But sorry, it's been, we publish papers left and right. It's a hot topic of research. And I'm sure that the automotive industry is well aware. And those who shouldn't be, they know how to do that. So we're just right at bringing knowledge here. The worries as some trend is that these parts are already in some of our critical infrastructure in our automotive. And for example, when you buy a truck or make a bus for tra public transit, you're not going to change it in two years. You're investing for 40 plus hopefully years of, uh, you know, to use that. And the problem with these the things are they're very expensive to repair. You have to go in, physically remove the part and place and put it uh, and its place, put a, you know, a real uh, trusted part. So my warning to the policymakers is that it starts moving. These problems exist. They're going to only show up more and more. And as an academia or, you know, um, uh, startups or companies, we're not at a position of power to control and to create this, um, uh, to create this uh, trust in the supply chain. It's all on our governments to start acting. Amazing. Thanks so much, Jennifer and Mitra. I guess uh, we have set the landscape for kind of the industry perspective, but I'd like to already kind of uh, I've hinted, we've hinted a lot to like the regulation discussion, right? And I'll just pass it over to Duncan so we can go deep into that. Duncan. Thanks, uh, Louise. So um, I think like, as I see it, we've been thinking about the, the problems of taking not, ju not just devices, but, but systems, complex systems and integrating information communication technologies within them. And on top of that complexity, right, we're introducing this, this, this autonomy, right? This, the fact that the, these systems are gonna operate with humans, if not out of the loop, increasingly on the, on the periphery uh, of the loops. And so I think obviously doing so has security implications as, as we've just heard, right? Whether it's in, in the supply chain, whether it's in interoperability or what have you. Um, and I think the question for us at the IGF, right, is how, how do we think about the bridge between these security uh, concerns and internet governance and it's worth noting I here, I think that, you know, um, uh, we've hosted a number of these sessions in the past and, and there we've been talking about a slightly different set of, of cybersecurity issues, right? I think we've talked much more traditional computer cybersecurity concerns about confidentiality losses, accessibility issues, and those are clearly here in this environment. Um, but <clears throat> I think it's important to flag on top of all this that there's a physical security concern, right? Like, what are we really concerned about? We're concerned about autonomous vehicles crashing. And, and the question, I think, is to step back and ask, once we bring um, uh, these autonomous vehicles uh, into an internet governance environment, how is the existing internet governance environment suited uh, to, to handle this problem set is, I think Madeline, uh, put it at one point, like, you know, is the internet that we've built the one we need or had, you know, we need for this, uh, situation. Um, and, and, um, apropos of our setting, right. I think, uh, where we often think about multi-stakeholderism, um, uh, in terms of thinking about governments, governance, I think it's important not just to, you know, think about this in terms of where existing, 
responsibilities and regulatory tools lie. That is like, what's the existing governance structure uh, and, and, and who's doing it, but where is the capacity, right? Have, you know, do we actually have the right actors and the right regulatory tools set up to regulate this environment? Um, or, or are we missing some, you know, clear, clear and obvious potential tools uh, that we've yet to kind of take advantage of given the, the alignment of these security threats and the need to regulate them. Um, and so what we've what we've tried to do in the next, you know, 25 minutes or so is bring in two tried and true mechanisms, you know, law uh, uh, and insurance, which we've dealt with, you know, for eons and other contexts to try and, and provide a, a governance function uh, and think about how they layer into uh, or connect with this autonomous vehicle setting. So um, really briefly, we've got Rebecca Krutoff uh, here to talk a bit about the, the law as an assistant professor of law at the University of Richmond Law School, who has a long history in thinking about cyber torts, where she's a real expert in other forms uh, uh, of regulation and has done so with respect to autonomous systems and other contexts. And we have Tim Davey of Munich RE, uh, a cybersecurity specialist there, where he works in thinking about how do you build um, cybersecurity based products for the insurance and reinsurance uh, industry. So I will, uh, as a non expert, quickly get out of the way. And Rebecca, hand it over to you. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this incredible collaboration. Um, my research focuses on the relationship between law and technology, and particularly on how autonomous systems like autonomous weapon systems and also autonomous vehicles raise different reoccurring legal challenges and issues. Um, now, of course, autonomous weapon systems are intended to kill certain people, while as Professor Ellis mentioned, what we're concerned about with autonomous vehicles is that we don't want them to kill or hurt any people. Uh, but both of these uh, autonomous systems, they raise the question of who should be held accountable when an autonomous system acts unpredictably in some way and something goes wrong. Um, so who should be held accountable? People have floated all sorts of different entities that are relevant here. Obviously, the designers, the programmers, the manufacturers, the commercial sellers, the users, uh, third party adversaries. Um, and then there's also the question of how much should liability depend on whether or not the harm was due to an internal issue, um, issues within the hardware or software, uh, or a malicious third party act, some form of adversarial action. Now, there's a bit of a growing consensus in the literature that if something goes wrong with an autonomous vehicle, regardless of the source of that harm, that the existing legal analogies suggest that the manufacturer should be held, and manufacturers and commercial sellers should be held strictly liable for those harms. Now, Folks often <laughs> talk about <laughs> the slowness of law and policy, right? And, and there is this, this pervasive idea that law cannot keep up with certain technological developments. In some cases, that is definitely true, um, particularly when new technologies raise novel legal questions. But in focusing on those particular situations, it's easy to overlook how there's a host of existing background laws and norms that guide and govern technological development. So currently, for example, under US products liability law, the difficulty of identifying different sources of harm, the sheer panoply of relevant actors, the diffusion of responsibility that's associated with attenuated supply chains, including all the issues that uh, Mir, uh, Ms. Mir Hassani discussed, all of this actually argues in favor of strict liability for autonomous vehicle producers. Uh, but of course, as Ms. Tilsdell emphasized, nobody in the industry wants liability for accidents, let alone adversarial third party acts um, or even issues arising from consumers you know, in, engaging in the right to repair. And so this existing legal backdrop that's already there will encourage those producing autonomous vehicles to retain humans in the loop, even symbolic ones. Um, to be a liability sponge, to absorb liability for accidental harms, to shield the systems themselves and the different actors in the extended supply chain from liability. Of course, 
this might not be the best legal structure for what we actually want to incentivize as we're looking at the possibility of de developing and deploying increasingly autonomous vehicles. Right? This might not promote human safety uh, or in more environmental transportation or the best cybersecurity practices. And so this is the time, <laughs> arguably belatedly, right, to step back and determine which accountability structures will incentivize actually achieving our different goals, uh, which of course requires thinking through the different hardware and software vulnerabilities, there are different associated supply chain vulnerabilities, there are different potentials for different magnitudes and types of harm. It also requires thinking through which actors have the capacity to minimize different sources of risk. Obviously, a lot of different actors, different countries, different industries, different consumer representatives need to be at the table to identify these different concerns, discuss respective capabilities, and suggest legal corrections. Um, Oftentimes folks, particularly folks in the industry, think of law as annoying, limiting prohibitions, something that needs to be you know, worked around. Uh, but law is often most effective when it changes incentives by regulating indirectly. At the international level, uh, law could be incredibly useful in developing norms around when states are responsible for harms associated with transboundary harms, uh, let's call them international cyber torts, and non-escalatory responses when states fail to take responsibility for those harms. At the domestic level, states can develop prizes and tax breaks and tech neutral safety or environmental standards that can encourage innovation while directing technological development towards a goal. States can also establish liability safe harbors uh, for certain kinds of harms to encourage reporting um, and evidence gathering, which is we need that information for oversight and system improvement. Uh, and law can also be used to set baseline requirements for insurance coverage, uh, which can also indirectly impact industry practice. Uh, but I am not going to elaborate on that because our next speaker can much better address <laughs> the power of, of insurance. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And quickly, I'm going to move over to Tim because I want to, but I'll flag um, after Tim's talk, one of the things we're doing that's kind of innovative in this session is we're not waiting for Q&A to the end. Um, we had some opportunity to get folks in on, on industry, uh, the pr industry's perspective, um, but if you're going to want to get in on the, the, the legal or insurance perspectives, uh, you'll have a moment in about five minutes or so. But Tim, first to you. Thanks. And, and, and thank you for the um, invitation. And, and also thanks for all the, the, the great talk so far. There's so much learning uh, and, and so much insight. Um, I'm going to spend five minutes, one, talking about sort of the industry challenges that we're facing from a, from an insurance perspective in terms of cyber insurance. Um, and and as, I, as I go through this, I'm going to flavor this with, with automotive, specifically in IoT, um, because I think it really highlights the challenges. I mean, you all have done such a fantastic job at highlighting all these challenges that we face. So, so hopefully this just sheds some more color to it. So as an industry, cyber insurance is, is relatively new, um, you know, comparing to say automotive insurance. Um, the, there's certainly been no major catastrophe losses. Um, we've had some near misses this year, um, but we do see, you know, the biggest change facing facing us today is is that rise in ransomware over the last couple of years that's where most of the losses we've we've seen and that's where most of the industry has has reflected on that and changed its uh, direction of focus in terms of how the policies are worded what is covered what's not um, and how how the industry in in turn reacts and and I think it's fair to say that uh, the insurance industry is fairly reactive to to you know the legal aspects and policy and the technology aspects. Um, Mitra has made a very good point of you know uh, and and Jen's made a very good point that from a from a technology perspective, uh, policy tends to play catch up, and I think I think that's true from the cyber insurance industry. Um, with, there are some leads, but I, I think there's also a lot of reaction in the space. It comes to the second challenge that we're facing um, it is really the insurability challenge. You know, what can be insured and, and what shouldn't be insured? Um, so we have a, a, an obvious exclusion around cyber warfare. Um, but then when we look at the automotive, in, you know, uh, connected vehicles uh, and uh, and where those liabilities lie, and, and, and Rebecca made a very good uh summary of, of you know the liability chain of, of 
of subcomponents in a in a in a system. You know, the, a connected car is a a large computer on on, on wheels. Um, translate that to all the other industries and where all the other large computers are. Um, multiply that by by Internet of Things, and you're suddenly impacting farming and all the other uh, traditional lines of business where 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 normally we're we're quite comfortable with what what we're exposed to. Um, so that really means that us as an industry has to has to mature and we have to understand all these complex liability chains to be able to define the right policies the, the right wordings the right legal aspects so to make sure that that we can actually ensure cyber cyber in in all its contexts um, and, and iot certainly changes the landscape and makes that more complicated um, one of the ways we can do that is and and we have a big drive in the industry is around data um, Short term, we look at it from a risk selection perspective. So, so what data can we we understand from an organisation that we're insuring or the risk that we're insuring? You know, how do we know what good looks like? How do we know what controls are in place? Um, you know, what what data are we seeing from from a organisational level? Now, that can get quite complex and quite quite. Uh, quite deep and if we, we start looking at sort of some of the, the, the comments that the meter has made around the hardware layer um, all those impact the the insurability of, of the solution and and certainly one thing that we're going to have to be looking at short to, to medium term if we're going to have a long-term future and a long-term market is is this this concept of trusted components or trusted computing where as, a, as, a, as an insurer insuring a, an entity we can we can certainly look at that supply chain and look at where there is trust in in the components um, and look at where there is best practice and, and 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 hopefully start to take away some of that complexity of of the whole um the whole system as a whole and and all the risks there and starting to to reduce that down into into subsections because otherwise i think we'll find that with iot and certainly with with automotive We'll start to see some very, um, very expensive products, or uh, which wouldn't be acceptable in in the market. Um, as a reflection on on today, where we're at with, with automotive, there are now um, automotive policies that do include some elements of cyber coverage. Um, so they they take uh, elements of um, mainly around system failure. Um, of the connected uh, elements of the vehicle and, and they start to incorporate into the, in, into the automotive policies for um, fleets and for and for individual personal uh, personal auto policies as well. Um, that's starting to become quite prominent in the states and and, and in Europe um, but it is still emerging so so you know uh, to, to be part of this this group and, and this industry um, insurance certainly has has a piece to piece to pay. Uh, a from from experience and, and trying to to understand and support the element of connectedness you know we can we can put um insurance products in place that enable the commercialization of, of and the adoption um and and some of the deployment challenges that we face uh, hopefully that's a, a reasonable overview in in five minutes of, of the challenges of of insurance no, I think I think the challenge of all this is we're trying again, not only are we dealing with a complex system, but because of the 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 number of not just stakeholders but perspectives, it it it, it necessarily requires us zooming along at 30,000 feet. Happily, people have responded to my invitation. Um uh, uh and I don't see any hands raised, but I may call out some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat to, to both of you. And the first comes from um, I think it's Neom. Uh, which asks about how do we set up um, safe harbor information sharing schemes to address concerns. I think about um, not the physical security so much, or, or maybe it does in some ways have physical security, but the sharing of information problem in terms of um, the IP or the data protection associated with this particular industry. And I think I wonder both from a regulatory or an insurance perspective, if either you either of you have any thoughts on that. Maybe Rebecca, I'll invite you first. Yes. Um... And here's the importance of multiple stakeholders is, is I want to reach out back to, to Jennifer and Mita and say, <laughs> where do you see information sharing being most important? Um, but I can say in terms of legal strategies, 
uh, what you want to focus on is, is what's going to be most useful to have information about. Are we most concerned with reporting attempted adversarial attacks, right, and sharing information on different strategies that are being used? Are we most concerned about gathering information about problematic actors in the supply chain? Um, and so it's, it's going to be a bit of a slice and dice question about the different types of information that we're interested in, in acquiring are going to require different Google uh, signs for figuring out how to encourage reporting about them. Possibly safe harbors is the idea that you minimize liability for harms associated with that things if you share information that otherwise you would be incentivized not to share, let's say about the fact that you were subject to a ransomware attack or a data breach. Um, and, and that legal protection encourages that sharing of information. Yeah, great, great point about the, the you know, safe harbors is, is a tool we've seen used elsewhere. And, you know, one wonders if we could, you know, see it evolve here. I want to take the same question to you, Tim, but layer on Daphne's question, because in, in hearing the answer about, you know, your emphasis on data and the idea uh, of you collecting data for insurance purposes, I wonder about whether you'd see that as a, at some point, a mandatory part of the insurance system, whereas if you want to be insured, this is the data you're going to need to provide to us, which which then leads to Daphne's question about like what what other things might you see the insurance industry through its insurance policies ending up uh, incentivizing the automotive industry or those who are involved in its uh, supply chain and the like having to do uh, or not do. So do in terms of, you know, more cybersecurity, not do pay ransomware. So I, I welcome your thoughts. Yeah. Okay. So um, data sharing and, and, and things first then. So I think um, absolutely, I, I think there, there's, there's a couple of ways in, in which data sharing is really useful that the cross industry data sharing uh, of, of expert data. So, so, you know, we're, we're insurance experts. We're not say the automotive or chip chip experts, but understanding the threats and vulnerabilities that they see on a database day to day basis and, and, and for us to be able to understand that and model that helps us to define what the products and the pricing and the accumulation risks are. So helps helps us figure out what it is we're insuring. Um, certainly from an insurance perspective, um, you know, standardized sharing of um, claims information, um, risk information around, you know, not, not every not every cyber incident is a claim. So, you know, that kind of information is all useful. It helps shape the industry. It helps shape policies. It helps shape shape what again that answering that question of what is insurable and what isn't. Um, so I think you know data, and we and we've seen that we've seen data sharing being you know really useful in in uh, and really effective in things like critical national infrastructure, for example. You know that that works really well. Um, in terms of that second question. Um, do we do we see more requirements coming in for, from from insurance? I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, we, we, we're in a we're in a market now where actually it's it's um, increasingly hard to get uh, cyber insurance coverage uh, for um, for the cost that you may have got last year. Um, renewals are are, are tough. Um, the 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 risk landscape is tough, um, and so we're trying to do everything we can to certainly from uh, the the small and micro businesses um, that we're we're trying to to join the, the the broader cybersecurity industry in education and 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 enforcement of good cyber hygiene uh, and cyber practices because they get they go a long way. Um, but I think as we start moving into these more complex risks, we're going to have to start seeing um, some more compound controls or some more uh, sharing of information. Um, because otherwise, you know, we don't necessarily know the depth of the risk that we're undertaking, um, especially when it comes to these supply chains. I, I don't, I don't know if there will be a, a you know, we'll get, we'll get the complete picture. Um, but certainly, uh, we we do a lot of work with with our, our clients and our, our insurance clients as well around how we how we help the the end insured manage and understand their risk from a financial terms. So, you know, even having a conversation between the CISO and the CFO around financially what their risk implication is of cyber is, is, a, is a big question for many organizations. Thanks. 
Um, so I also see that uh, Peter, uh, who gets a chance to speak in a sec, but let, let me kind of insert his question now. But um, um, now, I, before actually, since he gets a chance to speak, let me give you the floor. Yes, thank you. I have one more question about information sharing. I was wondering how much it plays a role where the company is actually based and the geopolitical dimension of it um, in sharing information information and, and what impact it has um, yeah, generally geopolitically, if a company, because we know that many component, components of vehicles are also produced in, for example, China. And so how do you see the impact of this? Thank you. I think, I, you know, I invite both Rebecca and Tim to comment. I think it actually dovetails with where I think Peter's question also kind of read about how do, how do different national competition laws play in. So I think both questions involve kind of what we might regard as a fragmented government space where instead of thinking about there being a single top down structure, we're seeing regulation uh, and, and, and insurance in, in multiple uh, jurisdictions. But I don't know, Rebecca, or do you have thoughts? No, you, you hit on exactly what I was thinking, which is, right, the nature of <laughs> this, <laughs> this chain of problems is inherently international and, 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 and fragmented. And so we need to think about and design systems uh, that address that, that issue. Um, and that's where having international norms could be important uh, and and sort of guide international guidance and best practices could be incredibly useful in, in at least creating some baseline standardization of, of some of these legal approaches. Right. And it can be it can be standardization uh, of of the actual substance or standardization on the rules for rules, right? Like here are the sorts of things we think are, are appropriate to be done at that national level. And here are the things that we should, should be left for a more of like, say the internet governance space or a multi-stakeholder approach and the like. I'm cognizant of our uh, time because I do want to hand off to, to Pablo as our third moderator, but I thought with just the two or three minutes remaining, I wanted to actually give you both um, the, the low hanging fruit question, which is you've talked about all this um, complexity, the, the rising need for data and the like. And I wonder, you know, as the kind of the lawyer and the insurer amongst us, what do you see as the, as the low, you know, lowest hanging fruit? What, what's the, the best leverage point um, for something that we might see done differently uh, going forward to navigate this kind of um, connection between, you know, um, cybersecurity threats, autonomous, autonomous vehicles, and the internet governance space. So um, maybe I'll go to you first, Tim, if you've got like the one takeaway you'd like uh, to have, and then to you. That's, that's, that's a tough, tough piece of low hanging fruit. Um, I think the, the, the takeaway for me, certainly in the, this space is, is, you know, we talk about data and, and, and if we take a lot of data, you know, what, what are we going to do with it? So simplicity is key. I think if we can break down the problem into, into simple terms and then build, build things around it, I think that that's important. Um, but also, you know, emphasizing my point of, of you know, basic um, cyber hygiene throughout the industry. If people are, are cyber, uh, cyber security conscious all through the design cycle, um, then hopefully that makes our life a lot easier because we, we have more trust in the supply chain and more trust in the components. So that's two things, but I like it. It's two it's things, but you know, oh yeah, well, no, you know, no, I like to push it. <laughs> yeah, simplicity, like the, you know, which I see, I hear you also saying mapping the environment better, like what, let's actually get some maps to simplify and understand Occam's razor, narrow things down. And then the hygiene point is, is always well, cannot be emphasized enough. How about you, Rebecca? What's, what's your, what's your. It was the most point? mischaracterized question. In terms of <laughs> <laughs> Just a well simple question. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think because of the amount of uncertainty uh, around not not you know, where the risk is coming from and what the risks are, uh, that the most useful thing is having more information. And I think because industry is so concerned about liability and sort of being left holding holding the bag unfairly in many cases, uh, not that they're unfairly concerned that they would be unfairly left with liability. Um, that actually having baseline requirements to be insured is, is a quick intervention uh, at, on the domestic law level uh, that, that would raise a sort of baseline standard across the board at, in the domestic level. At the international level, um, 
I would obviously like to see more conversation around around state responsibility for transboundary harms. Yeah, no, I think those are both um, great points. I, th I think for for I think for having covered the regulatory slash you know legal and insurance space, it's a perfectly appropriate time to step back and either you know the lens even uh, aperture even further and shift to you, Pablo, to talk to us about policy and and about governance more broadly. So over to you. Oh, this is fantastic. Look, uh, this is a very new thing. I've never seen uh, industry players from the automotive industry uh, or insurance experts or an approach about risk mitigation in the context of internet governance. And, and I think what we're bringing are very important, mostly unanswered, uh, but in a way, in their own silos, um, they have these questions from a long time, and, and it's a good time to have this interdisciplinary approach. And many have talked about the need to really start talking with, with others. And, and I think that's the motivation to bring this discussion to the IGF uh, in 2021. And I would like to invite uh, both uh, Peter Davies and um, Ine uh, to, to ground this discussion uh, to the internet governance world. Um, let me start with Peter Davies. Uh, and, and, and we have been discussing a lot about complex systems and, and you really work uh, in this convergence between safety and security. Um, so uh, Peter, uh, help us out to ground this into uh, what does this, has to do with internet governance and why it is important. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, much appreciated. And um, I, I, I think I think actually it's a really important thing. So if you look at the internet, it's traditionally been a been a best efforts type of thing, which has been fine for the kind of IT things we've done. It's grown immeasurably based on those sorts of things. But what you've been hearing on the areas that people have been talking about is a, is a completely different set of things. You've been talking about things where safety is the outcome that you're looking at in relation to that, where timing, not just from the point of view of, of you know, safety, for safety critical systems, you know, but the fact that these act things have to fail safe, the fact that you have to be able to, uh, to do updates. Um, so I know earlier on there was a discussion about the UN regulation 155 and 156 is the software update regulation in relation to that. And I would pretty much guarantee that the internet is a part of actually achieving the kind of rate at which you think you might need to do updates into vehicles on a global basis, but it's a best efforts thing. How would you do that? How would you count on being able to do those sorts of things? So this disjoint between, between things, and you heard discussions there about people are concerned, they are, they are fitting into areas in which as, a, as an OEM, yeah, as a supplier of vehicles, yeah, I have strict liability. You know, if I kill people, I have I have liability different in different territories, but I still have liability that goes on. So if the internet is going to form a major part of being able to do my 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 distribution part of my of, of my cybersecurity, then it's going to have to make sure that it can it can fulfill that. And I think that's a really important part for governance. Going back in the other direction. Yeah, we all know that being able to diagnose problems, being able to understand what's happening is a real time thing. It's not that we did it at design time. So chips is perhaps the wrong example of that. It's the emergent properties, the emergent threats that you see in these things yeah, that I think is a really big problem there. So what you're looking for is, a, is to what extent can the internet, to what extent are we going to be able to govern that so that we will be able to get the right timing information and the right, right things to attribute and be able to determine the sorts of things that we're looking at. And I think, I think industry is looking for that to be something that can be achieved. Yeah, but I think at the moment it hasn't been what effectively the internet has been good for. It's not been what, what's been the basis behind it. So I think there's a thing there where we need to step out from what we're trying to do in relation to that. I think there's a second thing in relation to that, which I guess went partly to the question that I asked. Yeah, everybody says you should share things in cybersecurity, but competition law says I mustn't share certain types of things, and that's treated differently. You can expect certain types of prosecution. So the idea that governments, that 
that policymakers have a really big place in saying you are allowed to share this information for this reason. Yeah, either it doesn't affect your liabilities or those sorts of things. That is something has to be written into these sorts of things to enable those on a much more global, global scale, I think. Um, and that has to then fit with national regulations. So in many cases, some of the attacks that we've looked at are global scale attacks, but the only organisation, the only, the only place that liability can be held, the only place you can look after that is at a national level. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, in a sense, we have to be able to look at how we do that. Just imagine that we had an attack on chips that actually stopped all food supplies worldwide. You can't hold that in a company. It's too big. You can't ensure that it's too big. So this crossover, and, we, and I heard uh, when we talked about insurance, this aspect about cyber warfare and things of that nature, it is not obvious what cyber warfare is um, in relation to these. And I know that's still a discussion. And the Internet Governance Forum should definitely have an element in relation to that. So this element of concentrating on legal questions, how you establish proof, what, you need, what evidence looks like, those are all elements that I think are really fundamental things that must fit with the discussions that we've had so far, but actually need to fit into some of the government, governance regimes that actually fit around the, the, the internet. Um, and I guess that's probably my five minutes done. So, so that, those would be my, my instinct. That's how I think it has to fit back into, the, into not just the internet governance, but, but, the, but the legal regulations in each of the, each of the territories. Peter, thank you. Now uh, we have uh, Dr. Ine Stemmons uh, lecturing futures at the University College of London. And uh, I mean, following up from what Peter said, uh, the first question I would like to ask you, Ine, is I mean, as decisions need to be made, are the right people on the table to make those present and future decisions? Uh, around the topics that we have been discussing. Hey, well, thanks, Pablo. So what a question. Okay, I'll do my best to give some responses to that and use it as well to offer some summary reflections on what we've heard. So absolutely coming at this from a public sector point of view and um, my work generally, uh, I work with and research on the, the teams. So these are the people who work in policy, either in like strategy, policy design and analysis that do. And I'm really struck by all the calls about really making sure that policy like keeps in sync and works at the pace of change working and that there's a need for action on the policy side. Um, and, and actually, Peter, your last question there about, so what's the, what should the evidence look like? That's the one I wanted to use as my segue to the stakeholder question, Pablo. Um, because that's uh, part of the questions that we work on a lot. And that's the question of when the nature of the system to be supported by policy and governance is changing, what is it about the distinctive attributes of those systems that tell us about new or different types of knowledge that are needed, how that's brought into a collaborative space, what kinds of methods, processes, approaches we use to actually generate evidence for policy from that, and then how we use that in informing decision-making. Um, three things that have really stood out from the discussion for me. Uh, the first is that um, it's incredible and we're all agree that there's a great call for a need for policy to take a role in enabling this information sharing, but very struck by the nuance here in going beyond information sharing and really using that shared information to produce evidence that informs a shared understanding of how the fundamental nature of these systems is changing. So yes, one part is mapping new types of threat understanding where they arise from, the associated harms and losses, but to really translate that into a, an understanding by multiple stakeholders of, and what does that mean in terms of fundamental change, different types of liability, or the way that's going to change behaviors by different actors and stakeholder groups. And so I hear here for a policy analysis community, a need for really supporting processes specifically aimed at that, evidence about fundamental change. And a lesson we have in the policy analysis community is that indispensable, critical, is that you have fora where the value that's really supported is conversation that explores rather than where the pressure is to identify specific threats and do risk identification. So something like this, a multiple multi-stakeholder forum where we have the creative like uh, 
what do you call that? Like we're free to think openly and not be criticized for not being accurate in what we perceive, but to be credited for the kind of openness of ideas that we contribute is something to absolutely not lose track of. So there's one observation. The second is thinking broad and lateral is super important, but the, the time horizons here that everyone is talking about, these like Mitra was saying at 40 year time horizons that are already built in, in terms of how these different uh, chains of influence are gonna cascade across multiple stakeholder groups and group and, and sectors. So the second from a policy analysis point of view is really asking what we have in terms of processes, methodologies for uh, to do long-term cross-sectoral analysis of the consequences. Now we expect there to be many of these technology policy for it, foresight for it, but actually there really aren't that many dedicated to that very long-term asking of those questions. So that's the second requirement we hear here. And again, in addition to information sharing, to really already be thinking about, and every time we do an activity like that, how can we work together in terms of not just sharing that information and evidence, but making it into formats that can be reused by others. So that in terms of keeping up to pace, we've really thought about the way that we contribute our insight so that others can keep learning and reusing it. And my third point is the one you just said there at the end, Pablo, about the stakeholders and how diverse we all are. And that to avoid, to avoid an approach where we basically say, well, we've been in silos. So now it is about convening and have a forum and we're going to share and that will help to really recognize that we do have different languages, meanings, and approaches by which, we, by which we contribute and pool our expertise. And so there's much that's happening in, uh, in policy innovation and analysis spaces about really playing around with new methods that try to address that. They basically recognize that you can't just summatively add different types of expertise, but that you have to support people as policymakers to explore the interconnections between that. And so those three, thinking broad, thinking long, and exploring interconnections have really practical implications that um, I think are amazing recommendations to make to a policy uh, working community. Thank you. This is amazing. I am starting to be conscious about the time and the first thing I would like is to see if there are any questions from the audience. I would love to see, oh yes, I can see the IGF-6 uh, small camera in Katowice. We would have loved to be there. It's very unfortunate that we're not there, but I can see many people in the room. Uh, anyone want, would like to um, have a, a quick comment or a question to the great panelists that we have had? All right, this must be so new. And, and I think that's part of the idea of this workshop to um, bring something um, that hasn't been brought before to the IGF and uh, to leave uh, you, the audience, with, with questions uh, that we can continue to elaborate in future IGFs. Um, so we went very much from uh, Detroit, domestic, manufacture, we talked about the nano dimension of the different parts included in this manufacturing process. So we went a little bit from hardware uh, to software, uh, to risk, to legal, to liability, to insurance. Um, when have we heard the voice of the insurance, insurance companies in the context of the IGF? Um, it's it's quite a, a, an important aspect of things. And, and actually, you left me thinking, Tim, about uh, how uh, the insurance companies can uh, actually uh, put pressure on, on uh, resolving some cybersecurity issues, uh, which is uh, uh, an interesting incentive to continue to discuss in the context of the internet governance. And, and we continue to zoom out into complex systems, as Peter said, and then um, sort of the tools for policy making uh, that that in a broad. Um, so I'm 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 quite um, in favor of trying to to bring all of this together. And for that, perhaps Madeline, um, we can come back to the beginning because you were the first one to ask uh, these questions and 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 frame these, these workshop proposals. Um, how did you find sort of your initial questions and now after this session, um, 
how, how did it go? What did you learn and what is next? Well, thanks, Pablo, and, and thanks to all the speakers and, and those who have, have raised issues in the chat as well. Um, I just feel really energized by this. I think this is, this is a huge, huge problem that in some ways is kind of the elephant in the room that we, we, have, we have somehow been skirting around for, for years, or at least the years that I've been working on cyber physical systems is that we're, we're essentially looking at connecting these systems to, um, to an internet infrastructure that, that isn't necessarily governed in a way that's suitable for them. And we, we need to bring these two worlds together. Um, and I think what we've done today and the people that we've heard from have just really highlighted um, a whole lot of challenges we knew coming into this session that we will not go anywhere near resolving this. Um, but, but I think what we have done is pull out a whole lot of the challenges and put them on the table. And I think other challenges were, were raised as well, like this, this question of whether we should have you know, representatives from um, communication channels, Bluetooth, et cetera, um, in, in this conversation. And I think that would be a good step for next year. Um, one of the key driving, there, there are two big points that came out for me. One is this question of liability, responsibility, and rights, and how we can begin to unpack that and, and, and understand that in, in this complex context. And the other was these kind of repeated calls for policy interventions to help manage this. And I think Ina's done a great job of kind of highlighting um, and also Rebecca did as well we we're talking about the, the, the legal contributions that are already in place um, but how we might step into this in a way that gets us out from uh, behind the curve um, but critical to that is going to be this conversation with the internet governance community about what's possible um, What's possible here? What is what is the art of the possible in terms of internet governance and, and matching up these very divergent worlds? One which, you know, as, as Peter Davies highlighted, is about locking things down, standardizing, homogenizing, testing, testing, testing. And the other, which is about, uh, you know, open exchange of information, um, uh, open standards, consensus-based governance. How do we bring these these two? How do we bring these two worlds into harmony instead of into collision? Uh, I don't have the answer, Pablo, but I think we've started the conversation. We have a wonderful array of panelists. I would like to see if uh, uh, one of them, of them, or two of them. I uh, would like to, to add some closing remarks. Um, your takeaways. Luis, what are your views? We cannot hear you. Duncan. Okay. Okay, I guess I, I'm, I'm back oh, yeah. now. Yeah, okay. no, I was just saying that it has been really a learning experience. I think we all uh, leave this session deeply enriched by the discussion that we had here. Um, and, and I'm thinking, as we did in previous kind of uh, panels, Pablo, Medlin, and Duncan, of this connection of, from like the very micro level of thinking even certification and the hardware up until what are kind of the governance structures, right? That need to be in place and what are the governance questions that we need to kind of think about when designing an inclusive policy development environment, right? And uh, and I guess we we live leave this this conversation just thinking, I, I at least leave this conversation thinking a lot about the question over um, what we need to do going forward in terms of designing these bridges across different groups. Um, and I think, you know, at the national environment, it's very specific, but what, what, what happens when we bring that to 
uh, an environment such as the IGF. So I guess, you know, I leave with that question, you know, which I think in a kind of triggered, you know, what can we do? How can we design in, in, but not reinvent the wheels kind of in that way? So, so for my part, I, I was intrigued um, both by Rebecca and Tim, you know, the, 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 the stepping, both the stepping back and surveying the landscape and the need for data and doing so. And, and it seems to me, you know, we're very good in the internet governance context at mapping, right? Like who, who are the relevant stakeholders and what, you know, what authority do they have to speak to certain, you know, what responsibilities do they have, rel relative responsibilities? And we map right, on all sorts of internet governance questions. And it occurs that obviously, I think that same, we're hearing that same mapping is occurring not only in the automotive industry, but the rising, you know, autonomous vehicle uh, industry and, and problem set. And I think they're gonna be very different maps. I think that's one of the big takeaways we, we have from this session. And the thing that I think would be the most kind of interesting is to take the two maps and try and create a mega a meta map if you will and and as Luis says look not just for a bridge but bridges like where are the where are the connection points at the you know the national level whether in terms of you know uh um the the policies the information sharing networks the cyber the, the security the isacs and the like uh what where the laws the national laws whether it's on competition or on uh, you know um, products liability, information sharing, safe harbors, the like, where they are, and then doing so kind of across national boundaries in, in, in the international space, particularly since, as we've heard from the very beginning of the conversation, you know that that when we once we bring in the supply chain, you know, as important as say Detroit is from a you know my own country's perspective to these questions, you know, it's not just about Detroit. That you know the products, the hardware, the software is being manufactured across the globe, and it's not just the final assembly of the automobile uh, that matters. It's each sensor, it's each um, light, and uh, and each connection point that's being inserted to these vehicles, where's that being made uh, and who their subcontractors are and it spins down from there. So, you know, I think, you know, Tim's call for simplicity is a great one. And, and I think that map is not gonna be simple. And then the question is, how do you use Occam's razor to simplify it and, and doing that sort of thing uh, might lead us to some, some um, interesting just insights uh, if we're able to kind of create something that's coherent. So that's my own thoughts. Peter. So I think I think the other one that, that I think comes into this from a governance point of view, and if you look at cyber security, very and particularly in complex supply chains, which is what we're talking about here, often one person's fix is another person's problem. Um, and where these are happening in different territories. So so if you look at the spectrum meltdown, you know, classes of things, um, and you look at that in the context of automotive, you know, the fix, you know, the fix to those sorts of problems was don't do don't do speculative execution, but that took twenty five percent of the execution cycles away from a from a safety critical component. So one person fixing it often ends up being another person's problem. But these are happening in different territories, and the other thing I think we haven't looked at enough is the is the data element. So so certainly looking at where the training data sets exist. Yeah, you know, compared to to other sorts of things, these are not these are not all on one area, as as it were. So so I think I think there are there are huge elements to do with complex supply chains and cyber security that are um, that don't manifest in the way that that most but that simpler systems often do. Fabulous. So we have seven minutes. Uh, perhaps a very quick um, round the table uh, with all the panelists. The challenge, uh, one sentence, you have to include the internet on it and your key takeaway or future proposal. Jennifer. I knew I was gonna be first. Um, the, you know, the very primary issue that we have here when it comes to cybersecurity um, is the data and taking a look at the future of mobility, all modalities of mobility, data is king. It's going to be the new business model. Um, so in terms of the internet, protecting the data might have a very different solution than protecting life and limb of the passengers of the vehicle. 
Um, so there will not be a single solution. It's going to be a layered approach, much like security needs to be a layered approach. And so I'd say our primary focus in terms of the internet is protecting the consumer data associated with the connected vehicles, because that is what awesome. I see that great risk. Mitra. Oh, one sentence. Um, it's getting very, um, it takes a lot to convince the people, even in the automotive industry, that internet security and automobility security are two very different concepts and uh, new threats, new concepts, new data sharing, new policies, new law, new insurance, everything has to be thought differently when we talk about the automobility and when we talk about the internet. Rebecca. All right. Um, major takeaway, I guess it's that it's not that we don't have a lot of autonomous vehicles right now. We have existing legal regimes that are governing them and are producing this, these outcomes that we don't like. And so we need to think about what legal interventions are needed to incentivize <laughs> the different aims that we've discussed here today, as well as the ones we haven't. Great. How about you, team? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think um, I think it's always how I always think back to you know the, the buzzword of you know it takes a village. Um, security is always. Um, something that is not just the security folk it's everybody uh, everybody from policymakers to lawyers to engineers to, to you know even even um, just general you know general general people um, and and with the internet and, and with things using the internet more and more these days that awareness I think is so key and, and bringing communities together of different groups and different perspectives we, we talked a lot about data um, one thing we didn't really talk about is, is, you know, the different lenses and different insights people see. You know, we talked about different governances in different countries. Those are two completely different perspectives around the same data point. You know, it, it, we'll only understand that if we we're all working together, you know, like that village analogy. You didn't include the word internet, but it was a very good well, thing. As, as people, everyone's using the internet. It was in there somewhere. Uh, excellent. excellent, excellent. <laughs> um, before Peter, Ine. Oh, found it. Uh, I know I'm almost last, so I should have the best sentence, but it's a really long one. <laughs> I So what I'm taking away a little bit different is one critical practical challenge for the policy practice community is that it's not only the mapping that needs to happen and information sharing, but the challenges in for the policy community drawing the boundary around where it distinctively should contribute to meet the needs for better internet and connected things governance. That's my sentence. I'll paste it, Pablo. Awesome. Madeline, your last uh, words to round up the workshop. Did we have Jen? Jen. Did Jen sorry. give her, her one-liner with? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Oh, sorry, yes. sorry. Okay, I'm getting mixed up. Um, okay, uh, I don't have a single sentence, Pablo. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't think I was going to be down for this, but but um, I think what I would say in, in summary is that this is a discussion that we need to pick up at the IGF and, and continue because um, I think there's a lot to explore. I think that the stakeholders that we brought together in this session um, are really valuable to this conversation and there probably are more, but I think bringing these people together into a, the, the conversation that we've had has been really powerful. And um, I, I have learned a lot today and over the, the recent months of, of pulling this together. Um, and I also think going back to the point that you made a few weeks ago, that we need to think creatively about what internet governance has to contribute also to this. Um, as having been a, a, a model um, of flexibility and adaptability. So that's that will be the work for us going forward this year, I think, is, is to think in both of those directions. And, and we certainly, I hope, will we'll convene again uh, this time next year, hopefully in person. 
that bring, brings us to the end of the workshop. Until the next IGF. And hi to everyone in Katowice and around the world. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Thank you all. Bye.